What do people mean when they say this is my dog? Does it necessarily imply ownership in the traditional private property sense? Or can it refer to some other form of connection? I tried to dig into this question a little in India with respect to street dogs there, specifically in Delhi. In Indian cities, there are people who feed street dogs on a regular basis. I decided to ask them some questions about their relationships with the dogs they feed. In the greater Delhi metro area, including surrounding commuter cities like Gurgaon and Noida, 188 people who feed street dogs on a regular basis indicated their willingness to fill out a questionnaire on the subject. Of that number, 57 of them did the survey and sent it back to me by the deadline. Those 57 people feed more than 1,300 street dogs regularly. 91% of them feed the same group of dogs every day. Interestingly, about three-quarters of the respondents have inside companion dogs in addition to the street dogs they feed. Not a single one of them regard the street dogs they feed as their property. However, the plot thickens because at the same time, 74% of respondents refer to all or most of the street dogs they feed as their dogs, meaning they say, this is my dog, about the dogs they feed. It got even more complex because when I asked if they would take the street dogs they fed with them if they moved, I got some very interesting replies, including no, because the local vendors are attached to the dogs and the dogs live here. So what are we to make of this? Well, for starters, it indicates that when a person describes a dog as my dog, it doesn't necessarily imply an ownership relationship. In Delhi, 96% of respondents who refer to the street dogs they feed as their dogs said they meant my dog as in my relative or my family member. What emerges, in the Delhi case at least, are relationships of connection or kinship between feeders and street dogs that defy the commonly received dualistic notions we've traditionally used to classify dogs as owned versus unowned, confined versus free, pet versus stray, tame versus feral, and so forth and so on. Instead of clean-cut either-or categories, we see continuums of connection between people and dogs, relationships of greater or lesser proximity, interaction, and care. 81% of feeders, for example, reported that they always arrange medical care for dogs they feed who turn up sick or injured. However, lest I've given the impression that all Delhi's street dogs are perfectly cared for, or that respondents just told me what they wanted me to hear, here's a reality check. 38% of feeders reported that none or less than half of the dogs they feed have been sterilized and vaccinated. That's more than one-third of people who regularly feed, admitting that they haven't done what are among the most important things that need to be done for street dogs. One third reported that none or less than half of the street dogs in their home neighborhoods are fed daily and provided medical care as needed. 38.5% reported that more than half or all of the dogs in their neighborhoods survive mainly from scavenging rather than from feeding by humans. Zooming out, this untethering of the human-dog connection from a traditional owned versus unowned framework is consistent with the trajectory of contemporary rights discourse. This is not limited to India. Various cities in North America, for example, have already shifted from the designation of ownership to that of guardianship with regard to companion animals. Is this just semantics, a politically correct pretense, or does it actually reflect a growing recognition that dogs are the subjects of their own lives rather than simply objects to complete our own? The move beyond dualistic thinking is also consistent with developments at the forefront of citizenship theory and multiculturalism, as in Zoopolis here that propose the granting of different citizenship statuses to distinct categories of animals based on the nature of their relationships with humans. Street dogs, for example, as liminal animals that share the urban space with humans, would be granted denizenship. That is, they would be recognized as having the right to live among people, the right to have their interests taken into account, and the right to be accommodated in pursuit of their ways of life. But hang on a second. Isn't this already the case in India? According to India's dog population management policy, the only interventions that can be legally undertaken are sterilization and vaccination. Street dogs cannot be killed or displaced, and the rights of people to feed and care for them are protected by law. 
I've actually argued elsewhere that Indian street dogs have already been granted de facto citizenship. In light of all that happens to them in Indian cities, I'm not sure how meaningful an observation that is. But in any event, it's based not only on their unique legal status and position outside relationships of economic benefit to humans, but also on recent Indian Supreme Court rulings that explicitly recognize animal rights and preclude human encroachment on the rights and privileges of other species. In India's courts, animal rights have increasingly prevailed, even against commercial, religious, and tradition arguments. While India's dog rules do not amount to positive personhood rights of the sort called for by hardcore abolitionists, they constitute a profound step forward when compared to how surplus dog populations are addressed elsewhere. There's an interesting debate in legal circles. Does law lead or does law follow when it comes to norms and behavior? Some say social change simply cannot be forced through legal engineering which may account for the glaring paradoxes we see in India with respect to street dogs. Great laws on the books on one hand, juxtaposed against a harsh reality in the streets on the other. By the same token, the plethora of street dog carers in Indian cities points to an inspiring ethos at work. These pockets of close interspecies connection remain as yet largely untapped as potential vectors for dog population management. As examples of urban interspecies communities, they merit further consideration, not only for what can be achieved through them, but for what they can teach us about the necessary complexity of human-canine relationships in free-roaming settings. Thank you.